Welcome back to Module 7, and welcome to the very last chapter of OpenStax Astronomy and of this lecture series. So in this video and the next, we'll be thinking about one of life's big questions. Are we alone? Is Earth the only place with life in the universe? Is it the only place with intelligent life? We'll start out with an understanding of what we really actually need in order to have life exist, what we know we need and what we can look for. And then we'll talk about in the next video, what kind of questions we really have to break the big picture question of are we alone, how we can break that down into pieces that are manageable. So let's start out with an understanding of what makes Earth livable. We know that Earth is a rocky planet. It has a solid surface. And we walk around as human beings on the surface. And we, there's lots of life that exists on the surface and in the oceans. But to have an ocean, you need a solid surface beneath that ocean um, to hold that water. If we think about something like Jupiter or Saturn, that is an atmosphere that just continues to get denser and denser and denser until it's too dense to survive. There is no cutoff where there's a surface there. So when we look for places that might harbor life of any kind, whether it's microbial or intelligent, we tend to look for solid surfaces, whether that's rocky surfaces or icy surfaces. The next big important step is the fact that we have a temperature suitable for liquid water to exist. Certainly in the winter time, in a lot of places, there is solid water, ice. And if our temperature were a little bit hotter, like Venus, we would have a lot of gas um, instead of uh, liquid water, steam. So the fact that it's at a moderate temperature and we actually have that liquid water, that pair of um, factors is one that we tend to take for granted. This picture here I include because it shows us the fact that it really is fair to call Earth a rocky planet. It is not a water world. If we took all of the water um, on Earth's surface, the bigger sphere shown in this little um, diagram, the bigger sphere is all of the water. The slightly smaller sphere to its right is the liquid fresh water, and the point that is almost too small to see on the globe, and you just kind of have to look at the bottom to see it, is the freshwater lakes and rivers, like the Great Lakes in the U.S. There is not a lot of total water when we actually look at our planet. So life here on Earth is in a very delicate and tenuous balance. And we talked a little bit in chapter eight about the fact that we as human beings are starting to throw off that balance in a somewhat dangerous way. So when we try to look for life elsewhere, we call that astrobiology. Biology is the study of life. Astronomy is the study of things off of Earth's surface, and so astrobiology is the surf for life on other worlds. It is an emerging and increasingly relevant field of astronomy, and it requires us to understand what life actually needs. Certainly, we only have the Earth as a single potential example for what life can look like, but there is a set of things that are true about all living things on Earth. No matter if we are talking about animals or plants or bacteria, all of these things are built with carbon-based chemistry. What that means is molecules that contain the element carbon are an essential part of the chemical processes that go on um, beneath our skin that are helping us to have all of these, um, these processes run. We also need liquid water, and not just because we get thirsty, but because the human body is more than half by volume water, and it's that liquid water that helps the chemistry actually occur, the body chemistry that we need. And all of the living things on Earth have deoxyribonucleic acid DNA or ribonucleic acid RNA that stores information in a cellular kind of structure. Now, first of all, our carbon-based chemistry relies on what are called amino acids. They're kind of the building blocks for proteins, and proteins are the building blocks for DNA. 
And amino acids have actually been found in meteorites. So we know that the kind of molecules that are required for life do exist elsewhere, and it is very likely that those amino, building, amino acid building blocks kind of form spontaneously out of the available material in the early Earth. Now, the Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s was a um, fairly famous experiment to um, produce amino acids from the starting point of water and ammonia and methane and things that would have existed on the early Earth. Now, the, the problem with that particular um, animation, or not animation, the problem with that particular experiment is that in the 1950s, they were using the best scientific understanding of the time. But from that point to now, we actually recognize that um, there was less methane and ammonia available in Earth's um, early atmosphere than what they actually used. So it's harder than what they showed, but it is still something that can happen. Now, this isn't a biology course. We're not going to go through the entire history of life on Earth. But it is worth recognizing one of the major milestones was when life forms, bacteria three and a half billion years ago started to use photosynthesis, which is the process of using sunlight as an energy source. And one of the big things that happened is photosynthesis takes in carbon dioxide, of which there was plenty, and gives out free oxygen, of which there was very little, almost none, on the early Earth. And so free oxygen started to accumulate in Earth's atmosphere by the time we got um, to about 2.4 billion years in the past. Now, for a lot of microbial life forms at the time, free oxygen is actually dangerous, poisonous to them. And so life itself kind of had to pick and choose and create life forms that could exist in the presence of free oxygen. And then eventually we get to the point where we ourselves as human beings require free oxygen to breathe. These oldest existing fossils that help us understand how these processes were working are called stromatolites. The, the fossils themselves are called stromatolites. And fossils as old as 3.4 billion years old have been found. Now, a couple of key things I want to point out here. First of all, one thing we always need to keep in mind is that the process of how life has evolved is not a straight line. It's a branching path, the tree of life. These oldest existing forms of life still are present and alive on Earth's surface. Certainly, they are not as common as they used to be. Um, at Grand Rapids Community College, we have a geology field trip that goes up to the Upper Peninsula, and there's a um, rest area that you can just park at and go a little bit into the woods, and there's this beautiful um, rock face that is basically exposed um, rock from the right time to see stromatolites in the rock surface. So these aren't, these fossils aren't located in only one place on Earth. They were all over the place. The organisms themselves, though, um, are much more limited in their current scope of where they can be found. In this diagram, there's a lot more information than we really need, uh, and so I don't want us to get overwhelmed by it. But it does help us point out a couple of key milestones. Our solar system formed over 4 billion years in the past. Photosynthesis was used by um, microbial life three and a half billion years in the past. We get things that are going through this process of using photosynthesis, sunlight to create oxygen for a long period of time. And it took until kind of about half a billion years ago, the Cambrian explosion is a kind of well-known milestone for this huge amount of different life forms proliferating in the oceans, where there's lots of liquid water present. And human beings have not existed for all that long. So I don't want us to memorize all of this. Um, this is really just giving us a broad strokes sense of the fact that Earth has had life of some kind on it for a very, very long time. 
but anything that we could call intelligent life has not been here for all that long. And so that's worth keeping in mind as we start to look for life elsewhere. We're going to start with a discussion of what we do when we're trying to look in our solar system, and then we'll comment on what changes when we're looking outside our solar system. But it's important for us to recognize that it would still be a big deal to find microbial or bacterial life anywhere else besides Earth. And when we are looking, we do need to recognize that what we as human beings think of as habitable locations is not the limits of what life can handle on Earth. These three images are all from chapter 30, where it's different extreme environments. So for example, on the far left of the slide, it is a river that is so acidic um, that it has um, this reddish color. And there is still bacterial life that, um, that works just fine there. In the middle picture, it's from Yellowstone, these hot geyser springs that are um, fatal to humans but there is life of some kind in those. And then the third is um, stacks at the bottom of the ocean that kind of bring minerals up from below the crust. And although there's no photosynthesis happening, this is so far below the surface that there is no sunlight, what we're seeing is being lit up by a submersible. There's still a whole ecosystem around that form of life. So all of these things are extremophiles. I'm not trying to have us memorize these locations, but we want to keep our options open when we're looking elsewhere. So certainly people's first thought within our own solar system tends to be Mars. We've got lots of sci-fi with Martians, everything like that. And it is important to recognize that we have a very wide array of evidence that Mars used to have liquid water on its surface in the past. Some of those factors that we said were really important for Earth to be habitable. One of the strongest pieces of evidence came from the Curiosity rover in 2012 that was equipped with the ability to actually drill down into the surface of Mars. As we send newer spacecraft, including the very recent NASA InSight mission, we will learn more and more and each time that we send a new mission, we have equipped it with the tools that we realize we needed because of the previously gathered information. It's kind of this ongoing process of learning more and focusing on what questions that we want to answer. So although no life forms of any kind have been found on Mars, the um, evidence suggests that it could have hosted some kind of life in its earlier history, billions of years ago. In terms of other locations in our solar system, some of the best candidates for microbial or bacterial life um, in the outer solar system are moons of the gas giant planets. So Europa on top here is one of the four largest moons of Jupiter. And Enceladus is um, one of the moons of Saturn. So on top, we see Europa, and Europa has these long streaks. What we're actually seeing are cracks in its icy surface. But as we go deeper and deeper into an icy object, the temperature gets hotter and hotter. And so it is very likely that Europa has what's called a subsurface ocean, where there's ice until there's liquid water, and then um, deeper, a solid core of some kind. And so one of the plans when we have the ability to send something is to send something to Europa that can actually drill down into that potential subsurface ocean and explore what's there. Enceladus is a sat satellite of Saturn, and the Cassini mission, which was launched in the 90s and spent over a decade orbiting Saturn, found that it has plumes of gas and ice that vent out into space. We didn't know about that before we sent the Cassini mission, and so that would be another candidate for future exploration. Now that we know that those plumes of gas exist, future spacecraft could fly through them to collect that, um, that material and actually study it. And then Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, has a thick atmosphere. It's the only satellite moon in our solar system that has a thick atmosphere. And it also has lakes of liquid methane on its surface. 
Now, methane-based chemistry is extremely less effective than water, but it is not completely outside the realm of possibility. And so that's another place where there may be some kind of life that looks nothing at all like that on Earth, bacterial or microbial life, but that has actually developed on that surface. Now, when we think about life elsewhere, life outside of our solar system, we need to recognize something extremely important. We can't go to these other stars. We can't scoop up actual material and analyze it the way that Curiosity did with the material on Mars and the way that we're talking about doing with Europa's oceans or Enceladus's plumes. And so instead, we have to recognize what kind of things we could actually discover from afar. So first of all, we talked way back in Chapter 5 about a star's spectrum. And it is worth noting that if a planet gets in front of a star, the transiting method for discovering exoplanets, it is possible for that starlight to filter through the, Earth, the planet's atmosphere and that would affect the spectrum that we receive a small amount. It is becoming more and more possible to make those kinds of measurements. And so we would want to be looking for oxygen molecules, O2 molecules, in that atmospheric spectrum that we might find. We also can much more easily determine how hot that star is. That's a chapter five um, idea, no problem, and how far away from that star it is. We talked about the habitable zone in the previous video when we covered chapter 21. And Venus and Mars are both kind of on the edge of the sun's habitable zone. So depending on if you're an optimist or a pessimist, we either have three planets in the official habitable zone of the sun or maybe just one. Those are the kind of things that we would want to look for as we study exoplanets and as we try to find an Earth analog. It is also important for us to finish this video and we'll resume um, with most of uh, section 30 point uh, with we will resume with section 30.4 in the final video of the semester. But one thing that's important for us to recognize is something called um, the Copernican Principle. So the Copernican Principle is something that suggests that we don't have a special location. Because our study of astronomy has helped us recognize that we aren't in a particularly special environment that has allowed life to exist. We aren't at the center of the solar system. This is why this set of things is called the Copernican Principle, because it was Copernicus's model, the heliocentric model, that helped us take Earth out of the center of our solar system and recognize that we're orbiting the sun. We aren't at the center of the galaxy. In Module 6, we've been talking about um, the Milky Way galaxy and how we're kind of on the edge. We're not even in a full spiral arm, but just a spur near the edge of the galaxy, nothing that is particularly special or noteworthy about that location. And as we started to think about in chapter 29, there is no center to the universe. So our particular galaxy's location in this infinite sized universe is not more special than any other galaxy. And so the Fermi paradox then, and there is a supplementary video that we'll see sh immediately after this, is really thinking about the fact that if life and intelligence are common and have a high capacity for growth, we should be able to see it. And if they aren't common, then we shouldn't exist. So that supplementary video will get into some of the questions and some of the ways in which we've started to approach this paradox. Um, it's another Kurzgesagt um, video and I really like it. But that's something that I need us to keep in mind as we move forward, that there are a lot of open questions as to how we were able to exist and what likelihood it is that there's going to be life elsewhere. And that's the focus of our final video. So I will see you in that last video.